Tony, today on Little Wars TV, we go island hopping for our channel's first foray in a land combat in the Pacific Theater. And which godforsaken spit of sand will that be, Miles? In 2023, it's a modern paradise for scuba divers. But this was decidedly not a welcoming destination in September of 1944. Today, we war game the invasion of Peleliu, one of the hardest fought battles in World War II and also one of the most controversial. Well, that sounds great, Miles. What part of the campaign are we refighting? The beach landings, the assault, the point? All that and more, my friend. We are about to refight the full invasion in epic Little Wars TV style. The entire island, custom built at a scale of one inch equals 100 yards, in a unique co-op style game. Three American players are given free hand in designing and planning their island invasion. Can they take Peleliu in just four days? Will they learn from the American mistakes made in 1944? Well, Miles, the island looks good, Thank but you. You, you could have spent a little more time on the minis. I mean, you didn't paint the eyes. A and don't even get me started on buttons and collar tabs. Today's stunning Peleliu War Game is sponsored by Pico Warmer. With smaller miniatures, you get bigger battles. The detail on these three millimeter models is exceptional, and you can paint an entire army in a weekend. If you're still skeptical, we'll give two lucky commenters free Pico Armor samples to try out. A pack of Japanese and American infantry, along with some tanks. Just leave a comment on this video, and you're automatically eligible to win. Our thanks to longtime friends of the channel, Pico Armor. One thing we need to address before we start is the deep respect for the participants of this grueling fight. The Peleliu campaign was expected to last only four days, not the two months it took. The U.S. invasion force was not prepared for the Japanese change in tactics from previous island campaigns. One cannot discuss this Peleliu campaign without taking into account the staggering blunders of the U.S. command. One of the failures, the U.S. command decided to transport drinking water to the island in fuel barrels. And these barrels weren't cleaned, weren't sanitized, and so the drinking water became foul, which caused immense problems. And that'll be a factor in our game. Frontline troops on both sides endured terrible conditions. Daytime temperature topped 115 degrees Fahrenheit. Do we have to say Fahrenheit? We're Americans, we know, we know what real measurement is. <laughs> the fighting was equally brutal. Both sides suffered over 10,000 casualties, including two Marine regiments with over 60% losses. Peleliu often gets overshadowed by events in Europe and deliberate downplaying of the American casualties by the War Department, a source of major friction from the participants in the campaign. But Peleliu marked a significant change in Japanese battlefield tactics. It did. The Japanese abandoned their reckless counterattack mindset that they had used previously and went with a strategy of defense in depth. The defenders constructed elaborate underground tunnel and bunker networks, maximizing the island's natural topography. The jagged coral and limestone mountains of Peleliu seemed tailor-made for this change in tactics. The Japanese goal now shifted from trying to drive the invaders into the sea to making them pay dearly for each inch of ground. Similar tactics would be employed on Iwo Jima and Okinawa with equally deadly effect. One of the best sources to really understand the tragedy of Peleliu is the book With the Old Breed by Eugene Sledge. It describes his experience as a mortarman during the Peleliu and Okinawa campaigns. It's not an easy read, nor is it filled with jingoistic bombast. It was also one of the primary sources for the HBO series The Pacific, which depicted the fighting on Peleliu in two of its nine episodes. It's impossible not to read Sledge's book or watch the HBO miniseries without asking yourself, was Pelu worth all the sacrifice? Why not just bypass it? I smell MacArthur in here somewhere. Yeah, indeed you do. The entire Pelu campaign was designed to support his return to the Philippines. This iconic image immortalizes Douglas MacArthur's vow to return to the Philippines after the Japanese drove him out at the start of the war. MacArthur's Pacific size ego had not forgotten that promise, and he was hell-bent on recapturing the Philippines. Peleliu is part of the Palau Island group, east of the Philippines. With two airfields on the island, U.S. command felt that Peleliu simply could not be left in MacArthur's rear. 
The Japanese might use this as a staging ground to harass American supply lines. One way or another, Miles, the tiny island of Peleliu had to be eliminated. And that tax falls to the legendary 1st Marine Division. We've built a custom 10 by 4 table uh, that is a detailed representation of the islands of Peleliu and Cebus. The scale is 1 each equals 100 yards, and we play tested a game I'm developing called Decisive Action uh, for Division to Corpse level World War II engagements. Yes, that title is a bit overwrought, but it seems to be a requirement to name World War II rules in that fashion. The island of Peleliu was very rugged and initially covered with jungle, so much jungle that initial U.S. recon efforts failed to understand the true nature of the terrain, a failure that would have tragic consequences. In the south is the main airfield and one of the largest of the three beaches the U.S. can choose to land on. Historically, this was the main landing area for the Marines, but our players today are free to develop their own invasion plans. There are lots of victory point locations across the island, and our U.S. players must cooperate to capture a majority of those flags to win. But they're also competing amongst themselves to see who can claim the most objectives while staying combat effective. After all, there's plenty of ego and ambition on the line for the Marine commanders on September 1944. I'm Dieter. I'm playing Chesty Fuller, commanding the 1st Marine Infantry Regiment. I'm John. I'm playing Bucky Harris, 5th Marine. I'm Dave, and I'll be playing hard-headed Hannigan of the 7th Marines. Hoorah! There is no overall U.S. commander. That responsibility will alternate randomly between each of the regimental commanders in turn. When acting as the overall U.S. commander, each player, the player can allocate divisional assets like the amphibious tank battalion and engineering company, and most importantly, the 11th Artillery Battalion to achieve the overall U.S. goals and objectives. The overall U.S. commander each turn also manages the off-table assets including naval bombardment and naval air assets. Each Marine regiment is a lost cap, and once that cap is reached, the regiment can become combat ineffective. The Americans do have one Army regiment available offshore from the 81st Infantry Division, the Wildcats. But will our Marine players get desperate enough to turn to the Army for salvation? Miles, I think you were smart to design this as a co-op style game because there's no doubt that the Japanese will eventually lose. That isn't the question. The question in today's war game is whether the Marines can stick to their historical timetable of four days. How many casualties will it cost them, and which of the three players will emerge from the battle with the biggest boost to his career? I'll be controlling the Japanese forces on this island. While I'm gonna be heavily outmanned, I plan to spring lots of traps and surprises on my American opponents. My force includes some 10,000 men of varying quality. I have veterans from the 14th Infantry Division, as well as some rather suspect troops from the Navy and Air Force. But I can hide plenty of machine gun and anti-tank bunkers, along with a handful of Hago tanks. The game also includes random event cards that are historically based, just to keep the players on the team. And the victory conditions are simple. All I need to do is hang on to 15 victory locations. That's it, easy. Just to set the context, the historical tally after four days was only nine victory points, well short of victory. It would take the Marines months, not days, to accomplish their full mission. And it is a big if. if if we go with this, what I'm suggesting, if those two battalions can clear this, we still have the beaches there to land additional troops to support and rolling up that um, hill. Do you want to land like maybe two thirds of it on this beach over here? Yeah. A third of it over here. And then depending on progress here, we can always land on this beach. It, like as we're pushing here, we can always land into these beaches. I kind of like that. I think. We know the mount anything in the mountains is going to be hard to take. Yeah. And it looks like there's enough victory locations elsewhere that we can just try to scoop up all the easy stuff. Oh, yeah. But, I mean, if, yeah, we take that airfield, and then we push up into this small hill. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I do. Th there could be trouble down there. Oh, I'm expecting. In, in the smaller mountains. <laughs> yeah. But, but we know it's, that this is, not going to be worth the this is the ugly spot. So yeah. anything we can take. Well, even even this yeah. shelling these beaches. Yeah.
Uh, after consulting our beautiful topographic map, the Marine Corps has come up with what we think is a game-winning or war-winning strategy. John? We're going to land two battalions on the small island there, one on either side of the footbridge to take the airfield and secure the crossing point. Uh, 7th Marine, hard-headed Hannigan, will be kicking in the front door right into those beaches, taking that airfield, dealing with any opposition. And Chesty, where are you going to be? Uh, first Marine's going to come in the, the back door here on the end of this uh, kind of little peninsula, uh, try to take out this bunker, secure these victory points, and then move inland. And I'm sure nothing will go wrong. Four days, we got this. modifiers since you're landing on the beach. You start to put, put the battalion on the table. Hi. Box charge would be good. Plus eight, seven or better. Not eight. Right. You may move up to four inches inland. Alright, do that one. Two dice. Oh! Ooh, that's not good. Four. And when LVT destroyed the shallow. Not good for right. the HQ. Yes. Looks like hard-headed Hannikin is swimming to shore. <laughs> Not on my so far, family. this is going quite well. Uh, put one there. Well, he's, he's got a double oh, bay. Ten. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Oh, drive us Tony. Sir. Do we have anything we should deploy here? Ah, uh, yes. Yes, by strange coincidence. It's the morning of the first day. We have waves of Marines disembarking on the beaches. Dave's landing has come under withering fire and has suffered heavy casualties. Dieter and John fare much better. They take minimal losses, but do have a few landing craft delayed by coral reefs. In this war game, beach landings are handled with a simple 2d6 roll on a chart. Attempting a landing on rugged coastlines incurs a negative modifier. This is a bit of an issue for the marine plan to attack the northern tip of the island where there are no ideal beaches for landing craft. Historically, this was one of several reasons why the marines chose not to attempt a landing up there. But our players are already rewriting history with their new plan of attack. They are risking the coral reefs to attempt the landing at both ends of the island. As his troops fire from bunkers and prepare positions, Tony places Japanese units on the tabletop. At this early stage, the vast majority of the Japanese still remain hidden. Only Tony knows where the defenders are placed, and he's using this magnetic map to keep track. But you know what? I think this battle report is going to be a lot more fun for you to watch if you let you in on the secret. Here's the Japanese pregame island defense plan. Given the slight change in scenario in which the Americans will be able to choose which of the beaches they're going to land on, I've actually decided to maintain the historical Japanese deployment. My theory being that if they land on these beaches, there's nothing for them to achieve until they get to the mountain range. That's where all the objectives are. And if they land in the historical landing zone, I've already got a killing pocket set up on either side of the airfield. So we're not gonna mess with history here. This worked historically, I think it'll work today. If I was going to predict where they're going to land, they're going to try and split up their landings in an attempt to lure me to split up my forces. Regardless of where they land, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to try and maintain concentration. I'm going to force them to commit to fighting me in the hills and fighting for this airfield. This airfield is critical to them. Uh, most of the victory locations are in the mountains and I already hold them. If they land here, again, I'm already prepared for that. If they land here, I don't care. There's really nothing there for them. I'm willing to forego one crappy airfield if, in the meantime, I can tie down and slaughter as many of them on the main island as possible. As we return to the morning of day one with the marine landings underway, it turns out they do want that crappy northern airfield at the far tip of the island. 
During his briefing, Tony was dismissive of any American tack at this location, so it must come as a pleasant surprise to see John's entire regiment landing at that isolated bottleneck, where there aren't many victory locations. Tony is less surprised to see Dieter and Dave's landings on the southern beaches, which is exactly where the Marines focus historically. And it's no wonder why. There are good beaches here with immediate proximity to a major airfield the Marines want to capture. Japanese defenses are exceptionally heavy in this sector, making this the perfect spot to concentrate the offshore firepower of the U.S. Navy. A limited number of battleship salvos are available to pound the island's defenses each day. On day one, Dieter requests fire against the point, the heavily defended rocky tip of the island between his landing zone and Dave's. They want to link up their beachheads as soon as possible to remove any Japanese threat to their uh, supply points. So he, technically, he John's battle. John's battleship, but he gave it to Dieter. Yes. All right. Uh, these fellows again. Who are we shoot at from where? All right. We are not using the dice. With the battleship? With the battleship? Yeah. With the battleship. Oh! There's some sixes. The American battleships pound the point, where the Japanese have a nest of pillboxes and dug in heavy weapons. On the afternoon of the second day, limited landing craft availability means the Marines can only land one fresh battalion. They chose to reinforce Dieter, but a poor die roll leaves the LVTs treading water offshore. I roll a three. Three. One LV be destroyed in deep water, it may not recycle. As our first day of the invasion draws to an end, John is the only Marine commander to cl claim a single objective. Late in the day, he secures the lightly defended airfield at the northern tip of the border. Dieter is bottled up against heavy Japanese resistance around the point of the island, and Dave is struggling to push inland from the main beach. His poor die rolling certainly isn't helping matters. Nine dice. One six. One in. <laughs> so much for that theory. Is there any game system where rolling low is good? Yeah. Not many. Alright. <laughs> oh. Whoa. Oh. 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 That is. Oh. Turn back oh. around. No. Turn me. No. Are, 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 are we recording? Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. I fall of the first day. Inevitably, we're going to lose the island. There's no if, ands, or buts. The question for me is, can I hold on to 15 victory objectives? The Americans did as we suspected they might. They landed in three locations around the island. Uh, this is allowing them to pick off some of the less easily defended victory locations on the perimeter. I still hold the mountains but at some point or another, I'm going to have to seek some offensive action against them in, in order to drive them back. I think the primary airfield is probably going to be the site of an assault on my part. The primary airfield is a large, open stretch of valuable real estate. Multiple victory point locations are here, and the ownership of the airfield will allow the Marines to bring in additional close air support assets. Both sides have already identified this as a critical spot, and on the morning of day two, Dave resumes his push to link up with Dieter and try securing the island's main airfield. Six dice. Come on, Hit no five. <laughs> you can kill him. Okay. You, got two you got him. I got him. He's gone. You can move up. Now roll the dice. Three, four or better, four. you keep your fuel. You're in trench. Yes. You'll be down by Stay. two. Dave's dice rolling has clearly improved on day two as he pushes deeper into the center of the island. At this critical moment, the overall commander today, Dieter, makes a very ahistorical decision. He wants to reinforce Dave's momentum by calling in the U.S. Army. Bringing in these offshore reinforcements will cost the Marine victory points, so it's not a decision to be made lightly. My thought process on bringing in the Army is uh, we know that we can't do this in the four-day target, uh, so giving the Japanese those two victory points early gets us the most bang for the buck, uh, giving them those points because we get to use the army much longer than if we waited until things got desperate at the end and we're like, oh, we need to bring the army in now. 
we're giving two points away for much less use of the army. And since I'm not actually a real Marine commander, uh, I have no point of pride on that. The real Marine commander in charge, General William H. Rupertus, did have a major point of pride in keeping Peleliu a Marine-only mission. His leadership and strategic decision-making was heavily criticized after the uh, operation, leading to his unceremoniously being transferred out of the Pacific Theater immediately following the battle. But it's far too early to say if our American players will be heroes or scapegoats in this war game. Already, they've adopted a more aggressive invasion plan and called in the U.S. Army to bring maximum firepower to bear as early as possible even if it means spending two victory points. Now Dieter faces another major decision. If the Wildcat Division is coming to show early, where will they land? Seeking to put pressure on the Japanese from a new direction, Dieter selects a good beach without coral reefs or obstructions. This will make the landing dice rolls easier to pass. Both of those gentlemen, landing on a beach, 2d6, no modifiers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. First, first, first battalion. Yeah. Our day is right. Eight. They're in. In and move four inches in them. Being right. Second battalion. Second battalion. Six. Six. Divert. Roll a one dice. Two. Divert two inches to the left. Two inches that way. Okay. Three inches that way to the left. I'm sorry. So and move and move to the shallow water. So we go in here. Yep. Day two, the Americans have called in the army to reinforce themselves. Day two was, it, was not my call. It was third my, battalion. Right. It, was, it was my call. You Six. get my ex explanation. Or die. Five. Diverts the other yeah, way. Diverts the other way. That's right. Yeah. There you go. Six. Uh, divert. Six. Six way that way. In the shallow. You can try to land your divisional HQ. So many defeats that they had. Well, I mean, we're actually kind of secure in the middle now. What would Chester do? Oh, he's in. He's in. They can go four inches. Four inches in. They come bounding through the waves. I'm working on it, all right? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, as, 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 the, as the overall commander? Right. Got it. Are you doubting our Supreme Commander? Are you, you need a wily that uh, Are you suggesting that Rupertus might yeah, be less than confident? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Remember, in this scenario, overall Marine Command rotates between the players, so while Dieter is currently in charge of the support assets, that control will shift throughout the game. At the moment, Dieter is cleverly directing American assets to his own sector, landing the army near his own regiment, and calling in off-table naval gunfire to continue pounding the Japanese positions in front of his Marines. The arrival of the Army also brings a number of powerful 105mm artillery batteries, which Dieter lines up on the beach. This formal gun line is easily spotted from the mountains where Tony has artillery of his own. Well, it appears I've got some 105s there on the beach. Look like a good target for my artillery. Yeah, it's a fine target. Do you really want to introduce the, the concept of counter battery fire to this engagement, Tony? Yes. That's the, that's the thing you want to start. So here we go. Hitting on fives. Uh, got one. One hit. One hit. Can I get a marker? And then over here on those troops, I have the one twenty. I have the uh, hundred and the heavy mortars. One fifty. One fifty. Uh, let's see. Four. That is four dice. And two seventy five. So I count as cover for getting the count. You get you get two for cover. One, I believe I have some shoots in the cross the airfield yeah. at uh, the one five. The Japanese have more than just artillery and heavy mortars lurking in the Umer Bergold Mountains. Tony has an entire infantry regiment of veteran troops dug in there. He could wait in his defensive positions for the Marines to come to him, but Tony can't help himself. He sees the Marines swarming the airfield in the open and feels now is the time to launch a massive counterattack. His bonsai charge throws an entire Japanese regiment supported by a tank company into Dave's Marines. Tank on tank action. We'll do that in a second. 
You won by four. Mm -hmm. So you look at the plus four. Attacker plus four. Defender smashed. All defending units make a full move in retreat. Uh, the attacking formation may make an assault move and can conduct another close assault if you come into contact with an enemy. So these guys are going to go back all the way here. We're going to drive those tanks out of that town. We're going to recapture that objective. All right. So you got your six dice. All right. So Tony, you need two, four, six. These guys cannot support because they can't. They can only close assault fire. They don't have. So, so you don't get them. So you get six, ten. And what are your hagos? Your AP or your hago? Oh, uh, the hagos AP of two. So I get two dice for each of them. His armor's one. So I'm going to get one die for each yeah, of them. But your one's flanking, so you get two back. So you get four for your high goes. You get on five. So you get six and on five. So they get double attacks. So you get to do anything. What are you doing? You're We're assaulting you again. Because you, you beat you so badly. Ah! One, two, three, four, five, six. You're back to the thread. Your destruction is complete. The Japanese attack, made in broad daylight, catches Dave completely off guard. He never expected the defenders to leave the relative safety of their mountain defenses and come out into the open around the airfield. The Marines still have some troops available in reserve, specifically one of Dieter's battalions. Rather than land them at his own beach near the point, Dieter diverts his reserve battalion to land at Dave's Beach. But the landing is a disaster. With LBTs rolling poorly to come ashore, Tony pounds the landing zone with artillery and flanking fire from a concrete pillbox that remains in action. Two LBTs are hit, exploding in the ocean and killing the Marines aboard. It's been a disastrous second day for the Marines on Peleliu, leaving Tony feeling emboldened and aggressive. A company of Hago tanks roll all the way down onto Dave's beachhead area, severing the Marine supplies. This means that da overnight, Dave's regiment won't be allowed to undertake any night operations or roll to recover losses. Japanese tanks down along the beach are quite a shocking sight to end day two. So we're nearing nightfall of the second day. I'm pretty confident that in a four-day plan, there is no way whatsoever they're winning this. I, I think, as long as I don't do anything stupid, I, I think I will uh, be able to hold them off for four days. I've taken some not unsubstantial losses, but they're still trying to get more troops onto the main beachhead, and I have a battalion on the point that hasn't deployed yet. I've been shelling the troops trying to get ashore. Once they hit the beaches, um, we're going to do a charge out onto the beachhead and try and wipe them out. We did recapture the airfield, so I'm feeling pretty good about how things are shaping up at this point. But we'll see what happens in the next two days. Going into the night of the second day, the rules do allow both sides to take limited nighttime actions. This can include assaults and Japanese infiltration moves. Tony is active in, the, in using the Japanese ambushes to keep Dieter tied up around the point, but at the far northern end of the island, it's the Marines who are taking advantage of the night. Through the first two days of our game, John hasn't seen a lot of action, but he's using a nighttime operation to continue shuttling more Marines onto the main island, setting up a major attack to roll down the mountains and sandwich the Japanese. It's been slow developing due to the rugged terrain and coral reefs, but eventually this pincer move is going to force Tony into some tough choices, especially so much Japanese attention being diverted to the other end of Peleliu. Day three dawns, and our Marine players are eager to regain the initiative after a miserable second day. They plan to use Tony's aggressiveness against him, turning all available air and naval assets against the Japanese infantry now holding the main airfield. These troops are no longer in their mountain fortifications. Exposing them to artillery and airstrikes will, will be devastating. Firepower is overwhelming, including the on-table artillery from the 81st Infantry Division, 
the Japanese are pummeled mercilessly, suffering devastating losses around the airfield and Dave's overrun beachhead. These are painful losses that the heavily outnumbered Japanese defenders cannot afford. The rules I'm developing for the Pacific Island hopping fights use fistfuls of six-sided dice for shooting in close combat. Units get a number of firepower dice based on their weaponry and typically need a five or better to hit the enemy. There are modifications to the number of dice you roll based on terrain, fortifications, and whether your target is flanked. At this scale, there's a lot of abstraction required because we're re representing large formations. Each base is a company and the maneuver element is a battalion. On this table, we have over 40,000 American troops and versus 10,000 Japanese. One of the appeals of the three millimeter scale is that you can refight entire island battles like this on a relatively modest table size. Wargaming in the Pacific has never been as popular as European theater, but I think planning and executing an entire island invasion has a ton of potential for a miniature game. I hope to continue developing this rule set, including solo play options where the Japanese can be totally automated. But in today's game, Todi is playing the Japanese. He's in the role of Colonel Nakagawa. Nakagawa revolutionized Japanese island defensive tactics, doing away with reckless bonsai charges and counterattacks. He ordered his men to remain on the defensive, fighting from tunnels and fixed positions to bleed the Marines with traditional warfare. It was hideously effective. Nakagawa committed suicide on November 24th after nearly two months of combat. Before he died, he said, our sword is broken and we have run out of spears. Three days later, the Battle of Peleliu was officially declared ended. Well, almost ended. 35 Japanese troops continued to hold out in the mountain caves until 1947, years after the war was over. It's wild stuff. In our war game today, Tony has not followed a Nakagawa script. He's been far more aggressive and active in his defense, and so far it's worked brilliantly. But on the afternoon of day three, the Japanese are about to taste some of their own medicine. John's regiment is finally in position to go on the offensive. And then this is going to be an assault, two, four, six. Um, the mountains are very rough. The mountains are very rough. Oh, yeah, very rough. Yeah. The rugged terrain bogs down John's first assault, and the Japanese continue to hold this end of the island with a skeleton force. In fact, I think this would be a good time to look at our map and show you the Japanese defenses. This is what our Marine players can see right now. But this is where the hidden Japanese formations are still lurking. Notice how little Tony has allocated to the northern and to Peleliu. All his strength is clustered in the south. Dieter finally managed to clear the point. It's been bloody hard business and cost First Marine Regiment dearly. But this removes the last Japanese foothold in that sector and gives Dieter some key victory point locations. Up until now, our Marine players haven't been able to do much with the Army reinforcements Dieter called in earlier. The Wildcats have provided valuable artillery support, but hardly made it off their beach. But it's not because of the Japanese resistance. It's because each side has a limited pool of order dice to allocate throughout the day, and so far our American players simply haven't seen fit to pay much attention to the Army. Well, until now. With the Marines unable to make much of a headway to date, resources are finally being allocated to get the 81st Infantry Division moving inland. They advance rapidly through the jungle, encountering a handful of bunkers and pillboxes, but no strong Japanese resistance. This quick progress leads Dieter and Dave to reconsider their approach. Perhaps instead of contesting the airfield, they should shift their efforts to link up with the Army. This new plan begins to take shape on the afternoon of the third day, forcing Tony to react. This unit in the woods, Miles? Yes. I have one, two, three heavy weapons I units. Have 12 dice. And two 75s, 14, 16, 16 dice. 16 dice, less two. Um, Light them up. In the woods? Get cover. Uh, harder to hit? No. no. Only entrenchments are harder to hit. I one company down there protecting the flying. Two. So we start Three, jumping across that water and get four, that flag. He, they should. Five. Five hits. Ooh. Oh, shoot, yes. Yeah, I'll take two stands off. Take that stand and another. Yeah. All right. All right. Um, that's all the artillery I have. 
So I'm going to play a card, Miles. All right, what card are you playing? I'm going to put a pop up bunker. Those are the best kind. Right. Uh, anywhere I want within two inches of the anymore. Or further away than two inches from the anymore. Um, I'm just going to stick him right there. And we're going to open fire on those guys in the open. Tony has just placed a pop-up bunker to try and slow Day's advance yet again. Random event cards in the game provide historically appropriate surprises for both sides, including events like spoiled water the Marines had to drink from and contaminated oil drums. But there are also some good events for the Americans, like naval intelligence or bonus air support. As we head into nighttime of day three, casualties for both sides are piling up. Tony has lost 18 units while the Marines have lost 13. Of the 25 victory locations on the map, our American players have taken just six. They need 15 to win, and we have just one day left to go. Historically, the Marines aimed to take the island in four days. That didn't happen, and it looks like our players aren't going to be able to make the timetable either. Day four dawned with clear skies. Skies swarming with American aircraft, hammering the Japanese positions. And this morning, it's John who finds himself in charge of the support assets. Not surprisingly, John directs the air and naval firepower to his end of the island, paving the way for another major ground offensive against the mountains. All right, I've got 246. And you've got two, two four. And I've got the tanks. Against the infantry. Six. Against infantry. And is the, the heavy weapons is within range. Can I bring that in? Yeah. All right, you're attacking me. So it's five and sixes. What's the distance to be in support? What's the unit type? Uh, infantry and the heavy weapons. Heavy weapons. Four inches for infantry, eight inches for heavy weapons. Okay. Yep. Yep. All right. So five and sixes. Because we're all out in the open. Yeah, two, four, oh, but oh, we're in, in the cover. Oh, cover. Six. We're six. Six. Minus two. Is he in mountains? Yeah. We're all in mountains. You had on sixes. I hit. I'm sorry? You had on sixes. No, he's attacking me. Okay. <laughs> oh, for the love of What the heck happened there? Oh! No, no fives. Sixes only. You had fives. I got fives. I got one Why hit. does he have fives? He's attacking me. You lose dice. He's not yeah. entrenched. Entrenched. You only oh. get sixes of trench. Okay. <laughs> so we each lose one. Right. Yeah. And you bounce. Uh, you got he's, got the, he's got the built in entrenchment back there. <laughs> where do you bounce to? Yeah, where do I go here? You just run through the lines. Just go back to your trenches yeah. where you started. Mm, just get back. Japanese defensive on the northern on the northern end of Peleliu now begin to break open like a small crack in a once mighty dam. At first it's a trickle, but by the second phase of day four, the thin ranks of the defenders are unable to hold back John's Marines regiment. Tony's overcommitment to the southern end of the island is suddenly backfiring against the Japanese as they have no manpower hidden second line defenses in the north. John's push surges forward, seizing three objectives in short order. The U.S. Army grabs three more objectives in the east, finally neutralizing the remaining bunkers Tony placed amidst the mangrove swamps. Can the Marines find a way to steal just a few more locations? Tony's surviving Japanese have been forced back into their mountain stronghold, leaving the airfield lightly defended. Dave and Dieter coordinate an attack on the af in the afternoon of the day, driving hard to recapture the airfield and its four victory point locations. Japanese mortars rain down from the mountains, tearing into the Marines. By the end of the day, the Marines have completely retaken the airfield, but at grave cost. Dave's regiment is just one point away from its loss cap, which would render his, the regiment combat ineffective and cost the Americans another two victory points. But barely, just barely, the battered 7th Marine Regiment remains in the fight. Gentlemen. That was certainly a hard-fought battle, um, with heavy casualties on both sides. 
Uh, but when we assess the flag ownerships, I, I assess the U.S. as 16 flags. But they did give two points back to the Japanese for bringing in the 321st early, which was probably the right decision. So it, it is a very marginal U.S. victory. But within you, it's actually not as close as the game was because one regiment really stood out. John? Uh, it, was, it was a hard fight on that part of the island. Landed uh, two battalions. And Tony, you just kept bringing more and more Japanese. I'm not quite sure where they all came from. Uh, Japan. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they weren't local. But John managed to capture over half of the flags of the U.S. side. So, John, you are the winner of the game overall. Well played, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Golf claps. Golf claps, damn it. All right. Well done, guys. Given the situation with the three beaches, I think I would have still done more or less the same thing. I think uh, fewer suicidal attacks mid-game would have been helpful. I, I was worried that they were scarfing up the uh, flags too quickly, the objectives too quickly. Yeah. So I launched a couple of attacks to retake the airfield. And while I was successful there, the casualties I took allowed yeah. uh, allowed them to take it back and I could never replace those losses. I think your first initial attacks really did throw off the Americans. Mm -hmm. um, but man, when you get caught in the open with that naval gunfire, that's a... That's a painful, painful day. That was bad. Yeah. I think if I would have changed something, it would have been I would have had Tony roll worse, and I would have had myself roll better. Well, wise words, Dave. Yeah. Wise words. And bringing the army in let us uh, open up a, a third beachhead and place our artillery in a really good spot where uh, we had range over pretty much the entire table. Uh, I, I think uh, by... Uh, Putting Marine Corps pride aside and calling the Army in as early as we did helped us out a lot. So totally unrealistic. Right. Yeah, well, if we were role playing, would that would have happened. never happened. And that beach was isolated enough that the Japanese couldn't really threaten you on that beach. Mm -hmm. um, I was really concerned after the first day uh, when the Japanese came pouring out and basically pushed me almost into yeah. the sea. Uh, it was not looking good at all. Uh, thank God the battleships were there and obliterated Tony. Um, but I think attrition really started to show. As you got into day three, yeah. Tony was just running out of men, which historically would be what you would have. And he had no ability to replace any losses. Right. You use that up. These will suck! <laughs> <laughs>